Blog Talk Radio. BenSound.com. Welcome, everyone, to today's Earth Energy Forecast Show on this Tuesday, June 23rd, 2020. Thank you for tuning in today, or if you're listening later to the podcast. I am your host, Joan Serio, and here we are after that huge solar eclipse on the solstice. We're still in eclipse season. We're still so much in that energy and also in the energy of the next one to come on July 4th and 5th. So we're definitely, and I've heard this say, this phrase used by other people, I've used it too, and I feel it's so appropriate right now. We're in the eye of the needle. So it's so important that we take time now uh, to look within, to reflect. We're in Mercury retrograde. We're still in Venus retrograde for a couple more days. We're going into a lot of retrograde. So the re-times to reflect, um, to rethink, to redo, to revisit our feelings of what we want in our lives, what we want in our country, what needs to change in our lives and in our country and in the world. So it's a very reflective time, and I think it's a perfect time to bring on today's guest, because today's guest is a spiritual teacher, and she has devoted her life to this, and there's going to be, I'm sure, a lot of wisdom coming out of today's show. Today, I have the pleasure to bring on president of the White Rose Foundation, Elizabeth Ann Hinn, whose life has been aware of attention to the spiritual, moral, and humane development of all beings, including her own. Beth has studied the world's spiritual and cultural traditions for five decades. She was mentored by many renowned traditional tribal elders of several continents, including Moses Peter of the Kutchin Athabascan Mar- uh, Athabascan, Martha Neck of the Wayupik Eskimo, and please, I, uh, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing any of these, Thomas and Fermina Banyakaya and Dan Evhima of Hopi. Other beloved elders have included Hoye and Francis Suzo of Taos Pueblo, Zulu High Sensei, Credo Mutwa of South Africa, Falasha Rabbi Ambrose Makawaza of Zimbabwe and Archbishop Maynard Doc Slusher, Vietnamese Tian Abbot Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh, and revered scholar Dr. Houston Smith. Beth was chosen for formal adoption by Seneca Iroquois grandmother Twyla Nitch, who named her She Who Listens to Truth. Her late parents and grandmothers and others raised her to a code of education, joy of life, and moral service for which she is deeply and grateful and quietly content. To the White Rose Foundation, Beth has offered education and service from 1995 to the present in almost 50 nations on all continents except for Antarctica, sponsoring lectures, seminars, retreats, scholarships for youth, and more. The White Rose Foundation also addresses cases of charitable need for families, couples, individuals, and regions. Her website is thewhiterose.org. I'm so pleased to bring you on to the show, Beth. John, I just feel honored to be part of it. And uh, all I can think of is when we sat together at our little family cottage some years ago, talking about the meaning of our lives and our aspirations, and here we are today embodying the same principles with great joy. Yes, yes, we are. And for that, I am deeply grateful 
that I have followed my heart and grateful that you have too, Beth. Yes. Yes. As we talked years ago about what you were wishing for and planning and the courage and the ordinariness that that takes where you, I think for most people, um, we find these doorways and we look for someone's permission to walk through them. Can I, in a pragmatic way, live my dreams? Can I try to aspire to really live as nobly as I, as I hope is possible? And that's really what you brought forward when you invited me to today. Could we talk about these principles that you and I both aspire to and try in our prayers and practice to live by every day? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you have studied with so many indigenous elders and uh, gotten so much wisdom from them. Uh, What are some of these prophecies that you have learned from them? And where are we on the timeline of these, of this change that we, that they knew and we know that we're going through right now? It's a great question. You know, I, my life really, my work has kind of been on thought. I, I watched uh, as a very young girl, I remember watching uh, President Kennedy and, and Khrushchev during the visit when Khrushchev came to the United States and the places where they had harmony and where they were slightly argumentative. And as a young person, I was aware that there was not respect held in our two nations of the United States and Russia for one another's sounding principles. And so the leaders were having a hard time with what I would call a translation point because we were not holding that the other one believed in something that was real. And I thought, how can we find our way if we can't be in a conversation regarding that what the other person holds is, is worthy of any respect? And I, I decided at that point, you know, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to study with my life. This is what my work is going to be. And then I went toward um, medicine and world religions. It's a long story. I, I acquired cancer in my late 20s, so I didn't go toward religion. I went then toward the study of philosophy of religion, but mostly because I would meet elders in my work uh, in the Alaskan bush, in the Finger Lakes, and then then traveled. And invariably, they would point to me and say, it's you, you've come. Or, you know, you have to come back, I'm going to adopt you. And I would think it's just me. And, you know, all of us are just me. I simply had some position I was to occupy, which these people were expecting. They were expecting a non-Native woman to come into their world and to to represent something. And I'm not the only person, but... What I found happened is I would meet an elder from a tribe and he or she would talk to me about their traditions, but he or she would also talk to me about their, their dreams of the future and the hopes and dangers that were before their and my generation. Most of them were in my parents to grandparents generation. I have several who are still living who are closer to my own age. I'm, I'm uh, in my late sixties. And so what what I would note is that the conversations were almost identical. And I'll I'll bring forward one from Kreta Mutwa, who was a Zulu, uh, the head of the Zulu tribe from Southern Africa, and has the strongest oracular memory of anyone that scientists have ever measured. He he knew like 160,000 stories from the oral traditions of his people. He just died last year in his late 90s. But Kreta said that He came to the American Southwest when he was a younger man in his 50s or 60s, and he met with some of the Hopi, Zuni, and Pueblo elders, and he said, we all had the same prophecies. And they didn't have telephones in most of their homes. They didn't have running water at that time in most of their homes, even electricity. They were from two continents separated by the Atlantic Ocean. And yet their idea of reality was the same. And their manner of prayer was the same. That from the strength of the creator or God, whatever we want to call him or her or that, uh, the Hopi call God, that great one. So from that great one, 
to all people, to our ancestors. They all had different traditions, but they were very reverent about them. In the present of their lives, then as middle-aged people and medicine men and women and tribal leaders, both sacredly and in a secular manner, they were trying to hold a directional compass that would guide us safely to the stars on earth through our generation and into the next generations to come. And they found in that that they all had an almost identical prophecy. I found this so interesting that this would be in remote areas of the world, you know, the the far northern Mm -hmm. uh, areas above the Arctic Circle in Alaska, and then the far southern areas down near, you know, the the tip of the the Horn of Africa. How could they possibly have the same story that they were telling? And it wasn't a story of history. It was a story that at a certain time, the entire human race would be affected by a question which would come to us. And at that time, according to the integrity by which we should willingly choose to live, tribe to tribe to tribe to tribe, individual to individual, man to man, woman to woman, could we represent it so that we would find a way that the earth might be sustained, the plants and animals shepherded, the human beings adequately realized that we would go beyond weapons into what the Hopi called the great peace, <laughs> or the fifth world. The Navajo also used, the Diné people also used the world, the fifth world. Or the Navajo used the, the dragonfly as emblematic as a symbol of this world, beyond the crucifixion of the Christians into a transcendent embodiment of a being like Jesus or a being like a great sacred figure from any tradition. So many of the people listening today will, will be from a Judeo-Christian tradition, so it's beautiful to bring that principle for them of the importance of Jesus into their lives. And for anyone who's listening from other traditions, we could bring like ideas from other faith traditions from our world. But what, what was talked about in Hopi that Credo also brought forward is but at this time, and the, the Hopi have a prophecy rock, this very tall rock that's over near uh, near their dump, actually, up on, on one of the high mesas. And in mm-hmm. it is carved a, lo- a low line. Below it is a, a man with a shepherd's crook. They call him Massaw, a son of God. And they say, in every era, Massaw is incarnated. He comes to the earth as a male figure. There's always a female with him. It might be his mother, a wife, a daughter, a, a colleague. But he's presented as the male, the active figure, but he doesn't have a weapon. He has a planting stick or shepherd's crook, and he is planting his corn. He's at the very left base of the, of the, of the stone. And then we see a line drawn up, and that at this time we come to a period when we can go one of two ways. If we go the lower path, we follow the path of the good shepherd, walking, caring for the earth, for creatures, one another. And then we find our way in, and we resolve into integrating into this era. If we do not do this and we go into the chaos of a kind of argument, warfare, we go to an upper line, which some of the Hopis say uh, is broken in two places. The first one Uh, being interpreted by many people as the First World War, the second break in the line, the Second World War. And then the third break, should it occur, is a Third World War or a, a, a sort of a conflict of life and consciousness where all of the beings are like monsters with their heads cut off, flying into space, so that the human life as we know it would be wasted, would not be realized. And the Hopi have held for at least since the era just before the Second World War, they have held that it was critical that at this time we would choose the lower line. And I talk about this. uh, The late Thomas Benyaka and his wife, Fermina, were very close to me. Mm -hmm. They are are buried in blankets, which my family presented to them, which are a Pendleton Circle of uh, Elders blanket, this beautiful Circle of Life blanket that has colors of the four tribes from the medicine wheel. And it was very important to Thomas that that would be how they would be buried. And Fermina contacted me and asked after Thomas died if I would obtain a blanket so she might be also buried in one. And then the family notified me 
after each of their deaths that this is how they were adorned. Usually a Hopi person is buried in his or her wedding regalia and not spoken of after three to five days after their death so that we may let them rest. But Thomas was chosen uh, during the World War II era as one of a handful of young men who were told to go into the world that humanity may know of this era to come, that we might know of the classroom all of us as human beings were to embody, and that the Hopi were one of the tribes on the earth who were to be fathers and mothers of this great peace. So he asked me, you you don't pass on your lineage in Hopi through the father and then the mother. It comes through the clan of the mother and then the clan of the father so that we don't form our son as the next leader and then our, and then his son and his son it forms on through which one of the children of the mothers and then the fathers is to be the leader in this way or in this way so he was not allowed to pick his son Thomas Banyaka Jr who has done a great deal of wonderful work with his father so I, I don't know what he asked of other people. I, I do know through some colleagues, pieces of work he had asked of them. But he asked of me a thousand times, no matter what happens on the face of this earth, you must promise me you will never stop teaching. And I would think it's just me. You know, it's just me, which is how Thomas felt about himself. He said, I thought that we'd teach for three years, maybe five, about the prophecies and do ceremonies and it didn't go on for three or five years. It went on for half a century in his life until he died in his, in his eighties. And so for me, I find that it comes to me that I'm simply to represent this. And then from Credo, the same stories, we will come to this time at this time. We, the human race must willingly in our free will make the choice or not. And so in this, period of the COVID-19 pandemic, isn't it fascinating that it isn't warfare that has turned us to a global civilization, but a tiny creature that doesn't have a life force of its own. You know, the the virus is not able to live on its own, right? They don't evolve, they devolve and slowly fall away unless they find a way to continue living off of, you know, the the creatures around them. So we have people willingly shepherding each other, caring for the elderly and the sensitive by, by remaining in a diligent spiritual practice of great maturity all across the face of the earth. And in an interior period where people with and without strong spiritual and virtuous practices are still living in a deeply spiritual and virtuous banner as human beings. And so philosophically, the question is before us, what shall we be the human race together and as the collectives of our nations and as one human race bringing forward our history of various races and cultures and tribes, yet not identifying with conflict but bridging those scars into a capacity of civilization together. And I think it requires the voices of all of us, virtuous leadership by our political and spiritual and social leaders, and great engagement by our younger people to be unafraid to dream, to pray that we be protected and guided in that dreaming, so that what we we stalk or we hunt or we engage in uh, the, the, the quest, not just the dream, but the embodied quest through the cells of our bodies as life. So that goes beyond the predator and prey into the humane being. What might that look like? What might that look like? And so this is the question I feel is before the entire human race as we pass through this very powerful year. Yes, and we can see that from all of the protesters that are protesting yes. the inequity that we've had in this wor- the whole world. I mean, it may have started yes. here in the United States, but it's it's prolific throughout the world now. And so it feels like we're all asking that question. Uh, what you know, like I said at the top of the show, what what is it that we want to become? What is it that we want in this world? And you said the same thing. How then are we choosing? How are we to choose? 
for that way, of what it is that will um, guide us through this time. Because you honor every tradition, every religious tradition, every indigenous tradition, you know, whatever it might be, you are that bridge. So as a bridge, what tools, what bridging will we need at this time to hear each other and to make these changes? Well, you know, historically, we tend to, without realizing it, define that someone wins and someone loses or that there is a conquest or there is an argument and there is a winner to the argument. So I was speaking recently with a colleague of mine who's a deep Christian this is several months ago, and he was very inflamed about uh, radical Islam. And it had caused him so much upsetment that he had a difficult time being tolerant of anything in the Islamic faith. And so no matter what I would bring forward, he would tend to be heartbroken of, over several people who had been killed in London where he lives. And I, I said, you know, um, did you know that, so as a deep Christian minister, he, he didn't know how to go forward and, and be inclusive, even though that was in his faith. He couldn't find a way to include Islam beside himself as a Christian. So he was angry at the idea of Muhammad. So a Muslim would say, Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. So we were having, let's say, an argument between Muhammad and Jesus. And then I, I thought, how can I answer this minister in a way that would bring his mercy God's mercy forward in him or tolerance because he just couldn't find a way that he didn't feel he was going to be conquered or tricked and I said did you know that the grave of Muhammad has an empty grave next to it for Jesus when he comes back in the second coming so that the Muslim people are honoring and awaiting him because he's one of their prophets and they feel they are to take care of him when he comes back. He was astonished. He, didn't, he, he had never heard of this. Most people I know never have heard of this. He, mm-hmm. it, it totally transformed his idea of what a Muslim person is about. And I said, well, you know, the word Islam means surrender. They're not surrendered to some kind of harm. They're, they're practicing where we are going with the rest of us. So if Jesus should come back and live on the earth in whatever way, then he could live safely, not be crucified, but safely from his conception and birth until he is safely buried beside the prophet, the most esteemed of all Muslims. Right? It's a very, that's a bridge. There's, a, there's something there mm-hmm. that we simply mm-hmm. did not know. So most of what happens, whether it's with Kennedy and Khrushchev or with my, my friend the minister, we find a place where we can't find the translation point, and so we try to be the predator or the winner because we are sure, you know, according to our history, someone else will come in and they will win or they will harm my child or my, my spouse or partner or my, my job, and, and I, will be, I will be beaten down in some way, or I will win and I will have more money or more power. So, but actually truth doesn't work that way. Truth moves toward realization. So two dual ideas come in and there's always something that isn't the dualism or the opposition, but the bridge between them. And because we're not intellectually trained this way, we all too often go to the mind and choose, this is good, this is bad. No, this is good, this is bad. And it's not until we let the mind be an observer which is there to protect us with discernment. But it's more like looking through an open window at a beautiful day. You're in the Finger Lakes. So back looking out over one of the lakes in the hillsides, you know, which is the family of the, the place of my family and my, my youth, my, my brother and sister and their families are, are still there. I, I still consider that to be my home. So if we're looking over the hillsides and the trees and the lakes and the, and, and the, the little towns and cities and farms, we look out and our mind is able to observe without judgment. And then all of a sudden something comes in and we judge it. This is bad or this is good. This is bad compared to me or this is good compared to me. And then we do this with another person until someone wins. But 
I talked with a, a close friend of mine, Reverend Cedric Gardner, who's in Atlanta last weekend. Uh, he's an African American man whom I've known for three decades. He was conducting a beautiful class, and I brought an idea forward because I I was aware that in our in our very cells of our body, we're trying to find like what happened. And so if we go to all the racial arguments right now or cultural arguments, and we have a Danish person and we have a, a person from Zimbabwe, and we, they're, they're both mixed race people. They may not even know their total heritage. I go, how do we begin or end with how many tribes they each come from? Which tribe wins? And the answer I gave was I said, you know, in your cell, you – you have the the uh, aspects that make up one of your one of your blood cells or one of the cells of your body, and about ninety some percent of that cell is empty space. And then you have a, a center to it, and you have the the different configurations that form the cell wall, and the the different pieces of it. And yet, a great deal of what happens. And the communication in your body is you might have something pleasurable happen of picking a flower or smelling a flower, and it travels to your brain and back so that you know that scent. Or you might have something painful happen. I cut my um, my wrist on a, on a jar. We were catching bumblebees in Corning where I grew up when I was a very little girl and in the driveway, and we had a mayonnaise jar, and had punched holes in the top and we were catching this gorgeous fluffy bumblebee and I fell down and the glass broke and it cut my wrist. So I came into the house, you know, and my mother was more shocked at the blood than I was and she wrapped a towel around it and drove me to Dr. Mulcahy's uh, little office over in Corning and he sat me up on the, his little bench and said, oh, Betsy, you have a good one here. He put five stitches in, but he said to me, do you know why this hurts? It's the most amazing thing. Your cell that was cut leaps across the big space in it to the next cell, and then across that space to the next cell, all the way up to your brain and all the way back. And it isn't until it comes all the way back that your cell that was cut knows that that's pain. He said, isn't that a wonderful thing? So the pain was not upsetting to me. The pain was a gift of knowing that my body needed to be cared for by such a benevolent human being. And his cells had the synapses leaping across to his brain to know just how to move his fingers with that threaded needle to sew up my little wrist. And then I jumped down, went out to my mother, and we went home. And I still have a little scar, and yet my wrist and arm and hand move just perfectly to take the hand of another human being. Whatever the composition of our racial heritage might be, so that through the synapses, the space in all of us that a Christian might call the Holy Spirit, that a Muslim might call Baraka or grace, that we might be unafraid of that gift of the creator of God, that great one, Mother, Father, Yahweh, Allah, the universe, if we are a, a sort of cosmologist and we talk in a secular way, and we realize we take our next breath unafraid of that state, and all of a sudden, even a little child will know what to do. And it will be of holiness, of civilization, no one enslaved, but together us finding a way to care for one another. And then like siblings, we say, I want the chocolate one. No, I want the vanilla one. And we say, well, let's split the cupcakes or the cookies or let's share them and we find our way. So a great deal of the fermentation of argument of what might have happened with one slave or what might have happened with another slave or one's from one nation or another or who sold them or they sold by Malaysian traders or did one tribe in the Sudan kidnap, you know, 70 members of another tribe and then sell them. And so we, we go, who do I blame? You know, which, which tribe do I blame? And so going back and trying to have that eye for an eye, there's that old uh, sort of silly but true quote, an eye for an eye will render the world blind. 
Mm-hmm. And so we we can't dismantle the scar by disabusing one another through violence. It becomes realizing many tragic things have occurred. And I am responsible for all of them as a global citizen. And I will do my best to be that living bridge through all the synapses, all the spaces of my cells that I reverently care for all of the cells of my body to the best of my ability and I bow to them and take the, shake the hand or bow to them in another human being and that we do our best together then what I find happens is something is revealed there's this idea of revelation coming to the prophets of different faiths or different cultures but Something is revealed to all of us at moments when we are able to be a receptacle or a vessel which receives beyond violence. We don't know when it's coming, yet it's there in every breath. So if we practice it, we start to be the instrument of that great peace that Jesus called it the peace that passeth all understanding. And then when we practice this, we are content we are not disturbed. We might have to build more muscle of that part of our soul and our spirit and our life. But we are on our path and there is, there is a contented meaning. And then we, we tend that as a good shepherd in one another to the best of our ability. Not perfect, but that is our prayer and our practice. And I, I think that becomes uh, something that's possible and very real in all of our world's faith traditions and cultures. And I, I feel that's very much where we are today. Mm-hmm. I love the analogy of using the body because we, each of one of us, is a community. We are a community of cells, and I love talking to myself. As a matter of fact, I had blood drawn today, and um, there was blood on my arm. And, and of course, when they removed the gauze, and I looked at the blood, and I said, "Oh, I love you, blood." You know, uh, just like that's part of me. And I always talk to myself and I always thank them and say, I love you. And, you know, you make up this organism I call myself. And so I feel that peace starts within. And I love the idea of that space in between because that's where all the richness is. And if there were no space in between, would there would life even exist? You know, what if we yeah. couldn't stop in between the breath? You know, it, it's it's needed. It's how this universe is put together. Yeah, and, and it's just not. It's just not how we're intellectually taught to think about it from no. kindergarten or first grade forward. So we we tend to become a little unnerved by the vulnerability of it. Yet that mm-hmm. vulnerability doesn't mean we can be hurt. It means we can be touched or we can be we are alive. And that is good. That is not frightening. That mm-hmm. is a safe and noble place. That is the human being alive and noble and well. Yes. And that's the true meaning for myself of power. When you that's when beautiful. you realize when you realize that it all comes through the heart and it's all connected and all hearts are connected and you just feel that. And and I don't need to be afraid in any moment because every moment is God, every moment is Allah, every moment is what you know, spirit, whatever you want to call it. Every moment is source. It's information flowing through me, is me. How did my body, how did each cell know what to do? Every breath is a miracle. Yes, it is. So when you live from that place, you always will know what to do. It is beyond violence. It's simply the question, are you willing to be and do that? Mm Mm-hmm. The vulnerability is a big question. Yeah. Yeah. That's before our whole world today. How shall we Mm -hmm. do that? And I think we're fully up to the task. It's just, shall we all take a breath and then begin the practice, you know, together, the whole world. And it's not perfect, but it is a, 
we've never talked about the whole world doing something together before. No. So it is remarkable. It's remarkable. And I think the young people are very ready for this. And I think the one difficulty, one of the gifts of your tribal people would be the the nature historically is a, a, a life close to the land and a life that is not impoverished but has a certain simplicity. Uh, one doesn't say, how do I simply acquire more things? It was more about what is the purpose of that item. And so in living in remote areas, I would be aware of not being armored by the material world. And then when I would come back into the the lower 48 states from Alaska or back into a city from a, a very rural area in the United States or other countries, I would find that people tended to armor themselves with their finances or lack of them their objects or lack of them is if they themselves were the possessions and not really alive within what they mean. I remember mm-hmm. watching a, a, an interview years ago on a, on a television talk show and, and uh, Orson Welles was on and he was a very powerful and kind of um, deeply sure of himself, very successful man of directing and acting. And he talked to the uh, interviewer about how people thought of him as being very arrogant. And he said, I used to be. And he said, I I liked my wealth. I liked my power. I sort of threw my weight around. And he said, I had someone visiting me at my mansion somewhere in Europe. And they liked a little object. I don't know if it was a picture frame or a little statue or a book. And he said, I like that object too. And he said, you know, I could have just given it to them, but I didn't because I thought it's mine. It's mine. And he said, I went back to the United States. Several months later, my phone rang in the middle of the night, and my mansion had burned to the ground. He said, my first thought was, why didn't I just give that item that my friend found so beautiful to them? Wow. And he said, said, I realized that I didn't like myself very much. I wasn't a very good person. And and the material world never mattered to me again more than, uh, this will be my words, more than my heart to the heart of another person. Never again. It was fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I think that for for most people now, there is a fear, what will happen if there's transformation in my life? What if someone else gets everything and I get nothing? And because we ascribe so much importance to the, or arrogance to what we own and possess, we tend to be frightened to not have a certain status uh, on a material level. So I, I think that the, nature of how we eat, dress, and uh, care for our our rooms or apartments or homes, how we live with it in a very, um, Wendell Berry is a good example. You know, he's a a poet farmer in Kentucky, kind of a national American treasure. But when he was a young man, he was kind of a a bit of a bad boy and he went away from home and upset his parents to some extent. And he, he came home. And his mother asked, you know, what do you want? And he he wanted to live on their family farm, which he has remained faithful to ever since, planting, growing with his wife, writing his poetry, raising their children. And he tends to live, I I don't know him personally, but he tends to live authentically with his sweater or his blue jeans or his shovel. They are for this purpose, for this shepherding. He's a great example of the good shepherd, and so is his wife, a very great example of the good shepherd. And so they live in a symbiosis as two people of that, of that embodiment. So I think that all of us can come forward with dressing ourselves in dignity, caring for our, our diet and our exercise and our rest and our home, whatever that may be, and our means and resources with gratitude and dignity so that it serves the purpose of that that movement of heaven through us. 
And then, you know, from the moment of our conception and birth to the moment of our death, we have been an instrument of that great peace and of beauty and of truth. And then the heavens can act willingly through us because we ourselves are not a weapon against another human being. I think that that practice is not difficult. We just don't see it deeply mentored nobly by many people around us. But it brings great meaning and fulfillment when we do. Mm -hmm. You talked about the young people and really wanting them to get involved. What about the new children and the latest generations coming in? What's their role in helping all of us to wake up and change and live a more simplistic in life and balance? Yes, that's a great question. Well, um, in uh, about 1989-90, I was working on a doctorate. I had a full fellowship at the University of Iowa in uh, comparative religions, and I was sitting very late at night writing a paper, and uh, I had a mystical experience, and for various people, Um, I'm going to go into terrain that is comfortable for some people and not for others. And we have different belief systems of how we hold ideas that happen, but I'll try to describe it in a way that I think is universally possible for people. I had two great beings come to me. I would call them angels. And they let me know there is a job for you. And I was just aware I set my pen down. And thought, my mother's going to kill me. Not literally, but my mother's going to kill me. There goes my doctorate. But they just came to me, and in the in the space around me, in this deep state, at about 1.30 or 2 in the morning, they just said, there is a job for you. And I, I set my pen down. And uh, I talked to Blaine, with whom I've worked for 35 years. Blaine Glass, a uh, man we've known each other since uh, the mid-1980s and do a, a lot of service work and run the foundation together. And um, I told him the next day, you know, I had this experience. And he said, well, what do you think it means, pal? And I said, I don't know. We'll have to see. I'll have to see. And over the next uh, year, I, I let go of the program. I was aware I didn't have whatever it would be to do the program and also whatever this was being asked of me. And I moved out to the southwestern United States and, and uh, brought my mother out with me for half the year me into, a little, excuse me, into a little apartment nearby. And then she would come back to our little summer cottage that my dad built during the year my parents were pregnant with me in 1953. His, my dad's parents had owned it before that. And uh, my dad had torn it down and then and then built a new little building that stands to this day just eight miles south of Penyon, New York. So um, I she would be there in the summer, and then she came out to to Santa Fe with me in the wintertime. So I, I moved to Santa Fe, and Blaine came with me. And he was working at a business, and one day he came back, and we were having dinner together. And he, he said to me, you know, the, the owner's son is very, very upset. His fiance has broken off their engagement, and he doesn't know what to do. And I said to Blaine, you know, if he would like to, I'll be happy to talk with him. If if he feels it would be helpful, I'd just love to do that as a gift for him. If he doesn't want to, that's great. But I, I if he'd like to, I'd be happy to talk with him. And this man, his name was Willie. He came to see me, and I talked to him about the fiance. And I said, you know, if she's met someone else and lied to you about it, before you're married, I think it's good for you to know this now and to see that your ethics are are very different from one another's, not being able to work them out. Maybe there's someone else for you. At least there is the noble part of yourself that can know that you loved her and that you are letting her go now because of the ethical differences between you. And I talked to him about taking care of his parents and his work and his own life. And his, and I asked him what his dreams were. And he went out into his life and about a month later, an old girlfriend of his ran into him and said, what happened to you? You know, you're, you're so great. You should be suffering now. And he said, well, I want to see this woman. And then she called Blaine and asked, could I come see her? And then, they told someone and they told someone and I, I saw thousands of people. It's this most interesting thing because I'm also very ordinary. And in the middle of these thousands of people who came, 
We had a two-year waiting list at one point. Uh, I had people want me to be on television, and I had these different interesting things. If you just lose weight and have a little plastic surgery, we could get you an agent, and you could be so amazing. And I said, no, no, that's not what we're doing here. <laughs> So not that that's a bad thing, you know, we're not, we're not go- going in that direction. But I had a couple come to see me. The woman had gone to my college, Smith College in Massachusetts, and the man uh, made some things for the Metropolitan Museum of, or the Metropolitan Opera Company's gift store. And they were visiting her mother in Santa Fe. And they came to see me, and they were pregnant with their first child. And they asked me about the child. And I was very aware of the child, and I was aware that I wanted to talk to them about things that mystically, we all always have things we talk about and don't talk about, reveal and don't reveal. I don't mean that we keep things secret or hidden in a treacherous way, but I remember being uh, 12 and coming into my mother's parents' kitchen in their home, and And the women didn't change the subject for me as a child. They continued talking as adult women. And I thought, I see I'm becoming a woman. They are keeping the stories on a mature adult level and including me now. This can be revealed to me now. And so in the spiritual work in which I've been trained, we we have a priest or we have a rabbi or a minister, and they might say a blessing for a married couple. And all of a sudden, when they put their hands on the couple's hands or they say, With, please take the ring out and I will say, I will ask for God's blessing on your marriage. Something is revealed and then we interpret it as a couple, a family, a congregation, a community. And so there is what is quiet and internal and then all of a sudden what is public and evident, self-evident among us. And then when this occurs in a codified way, we say girls can go to school, women can vote, men are to be appreciated for all the work they do, bringing their bodies forward, not as armor, but through that Y chromosome to shepherd and care for us throughout the centuries. We, we, we bring a codification of society, and it is good, it is true, it's noble when that is realized. There's no fighting it. Oh, we can do this and not kill the prophets or, you know, burn the women, the midwife where two children die. And then we find out later it was whooping cough, not a spell that she cast, you know. So, so we learn these things often in difficult laboring as society, you know, uh, matures over the centuries. So I, I said to the couple, you know, I just never have done this before, but I really just don't know what to say to you. I, I'm just going to have to think about this a little. Maybe we could reschedule for Thursday afternoon. And I ended the session and had them go home. And I closed the door behind them. And I looked up at the heavens and I said, it's just not done. It's just not talked about. It's just not talked about. And I have to say there was a pressure. It was an interesting experience. Uh, The only place I've ever heard it, seen it written about or spoken of There was a French woman named Mira, M-I-R-A, or she's called the Sweet Mother of Pondicherry. She was a very mystical Jewish woman from Paris who uh, traveled to Japan and different areas and studied esoteric ideas of metaphysics and spirituality. And she eventually moved to southern India to Pondicherry, the French province, and and, um, was the spiritual companion of of a sage named Sri Aurobindo who wrote a lot about transformation and consciousness. And, and the sweet mother would talk about, she would feel this downward pressure of grace. When she felt it deeply, she would dry flowers or write poetry or play her organ. And she would try to just embody, may we become the, whatever this is trying to be born of heaven. This would be early in the late uh, 19th and early 20th centuries is when she lived there. And so I, I experienced this downward pressure, and I, it was so powerful. I, there was nothing punitive or uh, disciplining or cajoling. I simply knew you must talk to this couple about their child. And so I called them, and they came back Thursday afternoon, and I said, well, 
It's my experience. I don't know what you believe in your religious beliefs, but if you believe in reincarnation, it's my experience that your child is the reincarnation of a particular sage who lived, you know, at this one point in the 19th century and did this incredible work for the Zoroastrian people and the Hindu people and Jain people. And, and the man quietly looked down and said, yes, he's been coming and teaching me in my dreams. He wants to be named this. He wears a white robe and walks down a long line of people teaching and blessing them and has me walking in a white robe right behind him. And the wife turned and goes, why didn't you tell me this? And he said, I, I just kept it private. And then he said, you know, my family doesn't have any spiritual books. We, we, we are open to different ideas of spirituality. We just didn't really practice anything. But the only spiritual book in our house is a book that was written by that man. And I said, well, that doesn't surprise wow. me. Mm-hmm. And so this was in 1991. And then I, they asked me, what should we do? And I said, well, God is bringing this child to you. So the authority in the mother and father is the two of you and your relationship with God, with the divine, with heaven. I would try to be virtuous, you know, inclusive with your family, Supporting the child with one in society would support internal gifts, just like we might say, gee, we have a child who's musical or athletic, so let's bring them, buy them a flute or give them guitar or piano lessons or voice, you know, have them sing in the school choir or let's have them run or play baseball in elementary school or, you know, buy a baseball man and, and play catch with them or frisbee. or. And so I said in the same way, these are internal gifts, and you might want to work with him and be with him, and I imagine he'll be or she'll be very ordinary, and then all of a sudden there'll be some extraordinary comment that he or she'll make. And so that's exactly what happened, and they, they moved to Colorado when their child was uh, in her late childhood. And so I started having different people come, and they would be pregnant or they would be wanting to have a child, and often most of them didn't know anything about this. They just unsought would come to me from different parts of New Mexico or the United States or other parts of the world. And uh, there are probably 4,500 of these kids here now of whom I'm aware. There are people who have written books about the crystal children or the indigo children because there, there can be a kind of a cobalt blue uh, state of consciousness that's that sometimes the mother feels when she's pregnant. Um, and the Hopi talk about this. They would say, at this point, when we make the decision of whether to follow Masaw, the, the, the incarnation mm-hmm. of whomever, this, whomever it would be who would be sent as a prophet or a holy man or woman by God, holy man and woman by God, um, that if we follow that pathway, there will be a blue star kachina, there will be a deity, a figure, an angelic human being or an, an ancestor's presence around us with a cobalt blue or indigo blue color showing that the era is at hand. It's part of their prophetic teaching. And um, they also have a teaching in Hopi that there is Jesus and that, that there is also an older twin who was forgotten. And they they teach in their, in their theology that... Uh, if the, they, they said years ago, you know, several centuries ago, they were taught many people will come of a different skin color or culture. When they come, they will be this massive number of people who will come. If they come and they have twins in their cosmology, you are to welcome them as family. If they come without the cross in a circle and with only one man as their teacher, then the cross being valued without the circle of life they do not know about Masaw completely enough you are to welcome them but not to believe anything they tell you because they don't know their story completely enough yet to go beyond warfare it's just interesting this is not my idea this was mm-hmm. told me about mm-hmm. you know a handful of five or six different Hopi and, and Zuni and, and Rio Grande Pueblo people from Taos Pueblo and Cochiti Pueblo. So uh, so these children, as they came, 
the parents would get in touch with me, and I, I would tell them, you know, if you uh, if you need to, if you need, I would refuse to take any money from them. I would say, you need to whatever you were going to give to me, please, because uh, I would do everything by donation. I would say, please give, please put this into what you do with yourselves and your child, or your and your other children, and whether you and just. Just whatever you are to do, that you, your child and you too and your family are intact. Just bring that back into what God is doing within within this child and, and all of you. And But I would tell them, if you need me, I will help you in any way that I can. And so I, I hear from many of these people over the years. I was reflecting over uh, one of them who's now in his 30s and is married and has two children uh, I met him when he was 13, and he called. He asked his mother one night at dinner, "Mom, what's the fifth dimension?" And he started asking this question. She goes, "I don't know. I think we better call that." So he called me, and I talked to him on the phone. Then I said, "Well, I'm not a great mathematician or things, but I think this." And he was like, "Okay, good." And then when he was 16, he asked, "Could I come see you?" He's about 15 and a half, and his parents had left town. His mother and stepfather had left town for a weekend, and. He came to see me and said, I, I'm going to throw a party, but I've never really lied to my mother before. And I said, well, you know I'm going to tell you I think that you shouldn't. Kind of like a grandmother. I think you shouldn't, mm-hmm. but you know, it's up to you. And he said, well, I think I can do it, and I'll never know. And you know, I said, okay. And so he threw a party, and then he came to see me afterwards. And he was able to put the whole house back together so his parents never noticed. But he came to me, and he said, I'll never do anything like this again. My friends drank against my will. They weren't respectful of my parents' furniture. They did things I asked them not to do. I'm really ashamed that I broke their trust in such a way. And I said, but that was a pretty quick internalization of going from the boy to the man. Right? Faster than I've ever seen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He never told mm-hmm. them. So I told them the day he was married about eight years after that. I said, you know, he had a party this one day. He goes, yeah, I remember. And his mother goes, I never knew that. I said, well, the most remarkable thing is the way in which he went through the acting out and his understanding of the responsibility and freedom within him and his gratitude to the two of you and to his late father. Remarkable, absolutely remarkable. So, you know, he he went on to work for Elon Musk with um, the last person Elon Musk ever hired personally for a job. Uh, with his uh, Tesla and his other some of his other projects, and um, he's gone on to do many other things. He's just one of the finest people I've ever known. Right. So what will he do in this lifetime? You know, he's probably in his mid thirties. He and his wife, who's this lovely woman, she he's a Caucasian American. She's Hispanic American. She has a remarkable family. They have a, a daughter and a son. So what will happen through them? And so, you know, my own experience is that he's the reincarnation of Matthew, the apostle, who, if you study theology, wrote a very clear, historic story of Jesus. If we want to go back and say what actually happened in the life of Jesus, and we're a a Christian, you know, uh, scholar, we often use Matthew as the gospel where we can find a more linear historic construct. And then we turn to, you know, John or Luke or, or Mark or, or the, the Dead Sea Scrolls and other, other parts of the literature. But so Matthew is as clear now if we believe it's him. If we don't believe it's him, he still is as clear as Matthew is. He's a remarkable, clear, virtuous man. He's not perfect. And yet what will be done through that soul in this body? Mm-hmm. As he reaches these three years. And so I think that this is present as a matrix all around the world in these children, whether it's the blue star Kachina idea of this blue energy through them or kind of a white clear energy of the crystal children. Crystal. Yeah. So rather, than preparing, rather than preparing for World War One or World War Two, I go, what is this we're preparing for? What is to be done among us, you know, the old name for Jesus is Emmanuel, he or that which is among us. What is to be done now for that which is among us and that which mm-hmm. is here on the earth now and coming? And we just don't know what to do if we don't have an enemy. You know, where's the enemy? I go, well, what if we are mature enough to internalize this and become the mature human being 
and put the weapons down. And that's what all of the great elders have told me would happen if we succeeded in this era. Our weapons would come down and we would enter this quality. I met Danny Vahima uh, in his years. He was over 100 years old when I met him. He lived to be 106. And uh, Thomas Benyakia Jr. told me he was the greatest soul, the holiest being that, that Thomas Jr. had ever met really his great mentor and he would Dan would sing to his corn he would plant with his planting stick until he was 105 and he when he met me he he I, we opened the door to his little home and I walked in and he pointed his finger and said it's you you've come and then he made the other two men with me Blaine and, and Seth Rothman leave and he closed the door and he said I was told I would live to see this day but that I would only live to see the beginning of it I would only live to see the very beginning of it. And he was overjoyed that the era was coming to birth. And then when the men came back to the house, he said, now you must go. I must do ceremony and smoke, use tobacco for, cere- for deep ceremony. Yeah. So, you know, what is this that's before us all? And how are we equal in dignity as we embody what's before us? And so I'd like to add one more yeah. thing, uh, mm-hmm. which is a story from the United Nations that I've told many times. I, the UN, um, the Hopi had a, a prophecy that the House of Micah was this important building for the world. And they came, the leaders came to say the House of Micah was the United Nations headquarters in New York City for them and that they were to be invited three times and that it was very important that they be invited in allowed to present their prophecies and teachings and to conduct ceremony. So they were invited twice, and I was contacted in the 1980s and told by someone, the Hopi are so worried, they haven't been invited back a third time. And when they've tried to bring political agendas, they're pushed aside as a kind of tribal people and not being politically or financially important enough. And they know that prophetically it's necessary for this third time. So I was able to arrange through Sri Chinmoya, Hindu uh, leader who was the uh, the Hindu chaplain for our, our U.S. Congress and for the United Nations. I was able to arrange through him for Thomas Banyakya and others to be invited to come and speak ceremony at the U.N. On the day that they went, the largest thunderstorm recorded in the history of New York occurred directly over the United Nations mm-hmm. when they spoke. And then four years ago, I was contacted by the UN. I spoke, I've spoken for them before in China during the big UN Women's Conference in 1995. I was their speaker on Chinese uh, religion and culture and and, uh, and cosmology and religion and culture. But I was contacted out of the blue four years ago. You know, and I, I have a life that's ordinary and extraordinary, but I'm not a famous person in a big um, corporate or political or, or financial manner out in our world. I have a very modest, uh, very private life, actually. And mm-hmm. so I was contacted by the United Nations, and they had sought 150 people they knew of from around the world because they said, everyone at the United Nations is arguing. We can't get them to stop fighting. Mm-hmm. And if our member nations leaders are not able to work collaboratively about race, and equality. Everyone's fighting over that nothing's equal. And of course, a basketball, I can't play basketball. You know, I can't, can't make jewelry. I can't, I couldn't farm corn. I could try, but I have friends who can do any of those things. One can do one, one can do another. And yet the fighting was over. Well, I want to do this. Well, I want to do that. Well, I want to do this. Well, I'm not equal. And they said, no matter what they tried in all of their um, aspects of statesmanship and sophistication, they could not get the fighting to stop. It was, it was breaking out everywhere. And they were frightened. They said, if this is happening here, it is a harbinger of war. They, they just knew that there would come a point when they couldn't contain it. So what they did is they, they invited 150 people from around the world to come, including me. And we came in for one day and, and we stayed in, in different areas around New York. I came and stayed at the Cornell Club. They arranged for me to come because my dad and my brothers all went to Cornell. And 
So the Cordell Club arranged for me to come and stay with them overnight. So I came and stayed and, and went over to the headquarters. And we went into the security rooms, the, the beautiful security chamber rooms. And we met with who, Ban Ki-moon, who was then the Secretary General. He's a Korean man, extraordinary man, head of UNICEF. And we sat for eight hours together, and we came up with one statement. All human beings are equal in dignity. And then we went home. And that line was written into the law of every member nation of the United Nations on that after, from that day forward. No one will ever know our name. We represented the human race. And so that bridge is present in the law of the United Nations. And the the land of the United Nations sits on the, the river to the east side of Manhattan, looking over toward Brooklyn and Bronx and Queens. But the land is is leased out or gifted to the world. That land is not considered American land. It's considered to belong to the world, right? And on that land where the Hopi came after such fear that they would not be invited a third time, we were invited to quietly construct that line. And I am certain that that line will not fail. I am absolutely certain all human beings are created in dignity. So if we can live from that, whomever we believe these children to be, may we pray that we be protected, guided in all ways, that that which is the good shepherd in girl, boy, man, woman, transgender person, anywhere on our earth, move with, as the very grace of God incarnate through your beloved selves that you sing so beautifully like Walt Whitman spoke of uh, through the Finger Lakes and me here in Texas today that we do this for all people that our past and our present and our future become that beautiful embodiment entrusted to us by these great elders from all over the world that would be such a fulfillment that's beautiful I was going to ask you to say a prayer at the end but you just did that was the prayer that's the prayer. That's the prayer. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So we honor Twa the Niche. You know, you sit at the Finger Lakes, where as a girl I asked my parents, where are all the Native Americans? And they said, well, they were given beautiful land. And I said, but why would you go to those pieces of land when you could live here? I didn't feel it was right. And then in seeking them out, I found that Twyla was from the very lake where I was conceived and born and raised, right? And then she adopted me. I, who should have been her enemy, became her daughter. Yeah. And so she, she's just so loved by me, Twyla. And her name means she whose voice travels upon the wind. Beautiful. And she would go to a, she would go to a grove of trees behind her home in the Brant Reservation, and then at her son Bob and his wife's home in Florida in her later years. And she would simply pray for everyone and everything. So I think we we represent this in honor of these great people who've gone before us. That we be their sweet children. We be their mm-hmm. sweet children. Well, that was beautiful, Beth. Uh, thank you so much for sharing today and your beautiful stories and, and gracing us with that prayer. That I, I call it a prayer that all human beings are created in dignity and that if everyone listening to this show, whether now or later to the podcast, just hold that in your heart, that all human beings are created in dignity and act from that and use that as a guiding principle that we can bring peace, the thousand years of peace to this world. Yes. And just imagine, just as explorers found a new land or people found, you mean women could be held equal or a human being might not be property, you know, that something is revealed and then we become the embodiment of that, that we have not known how to do before, but which we do now, which we do now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you so deeply, John, just for your love and who you are and all you bring to the world. It's just a joy to know you. I, I feel very um, honored to have been invited and included in your work. Well, thank you so much, Beth. I mean, you honored me to be 
to be here on the show and all of us to share this and uh, many blessings, the more blessings to your work. And thank you so much mm-hmm. for doing your work. And that yeah. we, we have this, this hope now. There is hope. Yes. 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 In each of our hearts. Yes. yes. And if I, you know, as a mystic, if I felt we were going in a dangerous way, I'd be the first one to say so. Because we'd have to prepare our children in a different manner. Yeah, but we need to prepare our children now for something awake and love that they have the courage to know that and be that. And then if we pray and practice that, we become the model for them. And we just do our best. Nobly and humbly, we do our best. Uh, please say hi to the Finger Lakes for me. I, I won't be coming up this next month because of the restrictions on travel and just the shepherding, but say hello to that glorious place of Queen Anne's Lace and great vines mm-hmm. and gorgeous weather and people everywhere. So mm-hmm. yeah, and everyone there, mm-hmm. take, take, good care of, take good care of yourselves and each other there in that most blessed place. Oh, thank you so much, Beth. And please take care of yourself and Blaine. And thank you so much for being on the show today. I will. My privilege. Thank you. So for next week's show, we have Eagle Spirit coming back on. And uh, she's going to talk about finding calm in the chaos and her five self-care tips for sensitive souls to to thrive rather than survive during this powerfully creative time. So I hope you will join us next week for that. And for the rest of the day, please hold that in your heart. All beings are created in dignity and act that way. And we will change this world one being at a time. Much love, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. (laughs) 